Some people think angels are heavenly messengers, but do they have halos and wings? Or are they just people around us who are there when we need help? Living Truth takes to the streets to find out what people think about angels. Who or what are they, and what do they do? Somebody would be helping the God or gods up there. Well, I don't necessarily think somebody has to die to become an angel. They could uh, uh, do it with their everyday actions. My belief of what are angels, angels are the people who just go around doing the things that we should do and they don't ask for any kind of recognition. I think angels are, are, are people at their best. Someone that wants to spread love and spread happiness, uh, someone that is considerate, anybody can be an angel. Even though it's not somebody physical, it's just somebody who you can just sit down and just, you know, gain your thoughts, get your thoughts together and ask, you know what, should I do this or should I do that? I believe that each one of us has a guardian angel and that angels are, yeah, messengers who do good work for God. Angels are agents for a particular mission. Everybody thinks of angels as something real sweet and soft, but I think they're warriors for God, trying to help Him protect us and, and follow God and Jesus. On today's program, Charles Price takes a look at what the Bible says about angels in Angels, God's Secret Agents. It's good to see you. Glad you're able to come and join us. If you're here in the last four weeks, we've been seeking to glimpse behind the scenes and what does the Bible say about the principalities and powers that exist that are not obvious to our physical senses or physical eyes in most cases, but are there and are real. And we're going back to that issues that we entitled Who's Who in the Cosmos. For one more talk, which uh, is going to be about angels. If you've got your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings in chapter 6. I'm going to read you a story here, 2 Kings chapter 6. And before I read it, let me just uh, explain that having talked about the devil and having talked about demons and these principalities and powers that operate in the heavenly realms that Scripture tells us about, we're going to talk today about angels. Now, you may have difficulty saying to yourself, what is the purpose of this? When we talk about the devil and his tactics in the world, we understand a very practical purpose. We are to resist the devil. We are to fight against these principalities and powers we're talked about in Ephesians. But when it comes to angels, we have an entirely and a completely passive role to play. We don't pray to angels. We don't call on angels. We don't uh, harness Angel, angelic powers in any way. Angels operate on the initiative of God. And so you might say, what is the point of this? It's a very passive subject, which it is. But I trust that as the Bible says quite a lot about angels, that we will be better informed. We might be encouraged about the activity of angels in our world. And just learn to trust that God in his sovereignty does use angels to bring protection to bring direction, all kinds of ways that we'll see tonight that angels have been involved in Scripture and also in history. I want to read this story in 2 Kings chapter 6. Let me explain the background. Israel was at war with the Arameans. And Elisha the prophet was advising the king of Israel with such accuracy that the king of Aram thought that one of his men was sending information that they had a, a spy on their side who was working amongst, uh, on behalf of Israel. But they said to him, no, Elisha the prophet has such insight, they said he can tell the king of Israel the very words that you, king of Aram, speak in your bedroom. So the king of Aram said, then capture him. And they sent an army to capture Elisha. He was in the city of Dothan. And the Arameans surrounded the city to capture him. And next morning when Elisha and his servant looked out of the window, they saw the city surrounded by the Aramean army. And let me read you what happened in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse... I'll begin reading at verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. 
Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And as the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road, this is not the city, follow me, I'll lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria, and of course that was a decoy, sent them off thinking they were looking for Elisha. He was sending them in the other direction. But we're going to just stop the story at that point, because the issue I want to just point out to you is Elisha prayed about his servant, Lord, open his eyes. And he looked, and there was uh, the hills full of chariots, and horses, chariots of fire, and soldiers all around them. Now, most commentators will agree this was an angelic visitation. What Elisha's servants saw when Elisha prayed, open his eyes, were angels. Now, I know they're in the form of horses, but angels become as horses. I don't know, but the imagery given was that they were protected. And present and unseen to the natural eye, and Elisha prayed, were these forces, he said, those who are for us are greater than those that are for them. And once in a while, God opens people's eyes to see. Very occasionally. We have instances in Scripture. I want to give you some instances, too, in more recent history. Many of you are familiar with the Martyrdom of the five missionaries in Ecuador some years ago now. Jim Elliott and Nate Saint are amongst the better known of those five men. Pete Fleming was another one. Roger Yoderian and Ed McCauley. Young men who were seeking to reach this particular tribe of unreached people who lived in Stone Age circumstances. And they made contact with them and they had a plane. Nate Saint was the pilot flew around them, dropped things to them, and uh, communicated with them in that way. Then they decided it was time to go in, and when they went in, uh, they were killed and murdered. And it was an event which was news around the world, sent shockwaves around the world, shockwaves across the church. They tell us, you know, that up to 10,000 people went to the mission field because of the martyrdom of those men. It had a huge impact on uh, missions. And when I've ever quoted that, speaking to missionaries, people said, I'm here because of that. I was, Hillary and I were in Thailand recently speaking to a conference of missionaries, and I just mentioned in passing this. I said, I'd be interested to know how many of you are here because of the impact of reading about those men, and hands went up. Even today, and this was back uh, nearly half a century ago. When Steve Saint, who is the son of Nate Saint, was here last year with Tomento, one of the men who was connected with this murder, his father, who they knew as George, was the first contact that these five missionaries had with the Orca Indians, as they were then known. And uh, Steve told me an amazing story, and we've followed it through, and I'm going to read part of it to you from a book by Olive Fleming, Peter Fleming's wife. Something that came to light, only after more than 30 years, in the late 1980s. Because Olive Fleming went back to visit that area. Now, a number have come to Christ. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, had stayed on there. Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, had gone in there. And these women had seen people come to Christ and a church established amongst these folks who are now known as the Waroni. Uh, they were known better through those books as Orca, which means savage, which is not a appropriate name to give them. And when Olive Fleming went back and with Rachel Saint met, met some of these folks who were involved. One of the men, his name is Kimo, he was involved in the killing. They talked about why it happened. And actually what had happened was that these men had a, a camera and they'd taken a picture of one of these uh, Orca Indians and they kept it in the, had it in his pocket and when they met with, uh, I think it was with this man George, they pulled the photograph out of the pocket to show it to him. Now, they didn't wear clothes, and they thought he'd pulled something out of his body, and when they saw the face of somebody they knew, they assumed they had eaten 
this person, that they were really cannibals. Apparently, that is one of the reasons why they came back in to kill them. They were scared that these five men were actually cannibals. They were going to eat them. But then, when Olive Fleming met with some of these people, I want to read you what she says. This new information, that information about the photograph and their assuming they were cannibals, brought a rather somber note to our beach visit. But before we had time to ponder its full significance, Dawa and Kimo, Kimo was one of the men who'd been involved in the murders, returned to their story, picking up from where the men were killed. Rachel Saint is translating for Olive's benefit, talking to them. And Rachel said, they heard singing. She was very puzzled. We looked at each other. Who was singing? The five men? Rachel asked them the question, and Dara's answer was no. Their dead bodies were lying on the beach. So who was singing? Rachel was concentrating too deeply to answer that question to us. That was Olive and her husband and son who were there, her daughter who were there. We could only listen to the excited chatter of Dawa and Kima and wait for translation break. Back and forth the dialogue went as Rachel asked questions and the Indians continued their animated description. Dawa pointed behind us. They were, by the way, on the beach at this point where these men were killed when they were hearing this. Dawa pointed behind us and swept his arm over the trees as he spoke. Something had happened over the jungles. It was too critical a time for us to break in with questions. Finally, there was a pause. Rachel herself, confounded, then proceeded to tell us a story that we could hardly comprehend, let alone believe. We'd never heard this before. After the men were killed, Dawa in the woods and Kima on the beach heard singing, Rachel said. As they looked up over the tops of the trees, they saw a large group of people. They were all singing, and it looked as if there were a hundred flashlights. Flashli flashlights, I asked. Rachel explained, this is the only word for bright light that they knew. But they said it was very bright and flashing, then suddenly it disappeared. And she says, we had no idea whether Kimo and Dawa knew we were struggling to believe their story, but Kimo wanted to say something. He said this, when the disciples of Jesus were in the canoe, because these folks have now become Christians, when they were in the canoe and saw Jesus walking towards them on the water, they were afraid. They thought Jesus was a ghost. He said, we were just like the disciples. We were afraid. We didn't know what we'd seen. Never seen this before. When the disciples knew it was Jesus, they were not afraid. Later, when we heard God's word, we were no longer afraid. Kimo's explanation only raised more questions. Standing on the beach, our clothes soaked from the rain. We tried to sort out what we'd heard. We wondered, they invented the story to gain approval? No, that was impossible. It came out far too spontaneously between the two of them. Too much planning would have been required for them to cor correlate the facts. We all had watched their faces and their elaborate gesturing. There was no question. They had seen something. Later, she writes, as we climbed back into the canoe, I wondered if God had chosen to display the light of his glory, a glimpse of the unseen to the fierce and primitive orcas as they stood on this very beach. Was it possible? It used the man's fatal mistake as his opportunity to break through to these orcas who had been bound by such incredible darkness and evil. Dawa later indicated so. She told Rachel that the vision was what first led her to believe that there was a God. And when Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel and Demuya, who had become a Christian, eventually arrived, Dawa became the first Christian in the tribe. Billy Graham wrote a book called Angels, God's Secret Agents. I've stolen the title. A great title. He tells a number of stories. He tells the story of Curry Ten Boom. Many of you know Curry Ten Boom, who, Dutch lady who had shielded... Jews in her home in Holland during the Nazi occupation in the early 40s and she and her whole family had been taken off and had been put into the concentration camp in uh, Germany in Ravensburg and uh, Billy Graham quotes the story from one of Corrie Ten Boom's books she says together we entered the terrifying building this is at Ravensbrück, the concentration camp at a table, there were women who took away all our possessions. Everyone had to undress, complete, and then go to a room where her hair was checked. 
I asked a woman who was busy checking the possessions of the new arrivals if I, if I might use the toilet. She pointed to a door and I discovered that the convenience was nothing more than a hole in the shower room floor. Betsy, that was her sister, stayed close beside me all the time. Suddenly I had an inspiration. Quick, take off your woolen underwear. I whispered to her. I rolled it up with mine and laid the bundle in a corner with my little Bible. The spot was alive with cockroaches, but I didn't worry about that. I felt wonderfully relieved and happy. The Lord is busy answering our prayers, Betsy, I whispered. We should not have to make the sacrifice of all our clothes. We hurried back to the row of women waiting to be undressed. A little later, after we'd had our showers and put on our shirts and shabby dresses, I hid the roll of underwear and my Bible under my dress. It bulged out, obviously, through my dress, but I prayed, Lord, cause your angels to surround me and let them not be transparent today, for the gods must not see me. I felt perfectly at ease. Calmly, I passed the guards. Everyone was checked from the front, the sides, and the back. Not a bulge escaped the eyes of the guard. The woman just in front of me had hidden a woolen vest under her dress. It was taken from her, but they let me pass. They did not even see me. Betsy, right behind me, was searched. Didn't even acknowledge me. But outside, another danger awaited. On each side of the door were women who looked everyone over for a second time. They felt over the body of each one who passed. I knew they would not see me, for the angels were still surrounding me. I was not even surprised when they just passed by me. But within me rose the jubilant cry, Oh, Lord, if you so answer prayer, I can face even Ravensbrook unafraid. And Billy Graham adds, after telling that story, Every true believer in Christ should be encouraged and strengthened. Angels are watching. They mark your path. They superintend the events of your life and protect the interests of the Lord God, always working to promote His plan to bring about His highest will for you. Angels are interested spectators and mark all you do, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. That's a quotation from 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. God assigns angelic powers to watch over you. There are events and times in Scripture when angels intervene. And actually, there's a lot of interest in angels right at the moment. Some of it may be good, a lot of it is not good. You look up angels on the Internet, and boy, you find page after page. Once you get over the Anaheim angels, <laughs> a lot of it is superstition. Story after story of people who say they've met with angels, and most of them I don't actually believe, because they're not Christian stories. There's a magazine called Angels on Earth. It has over half a million subscribers in North America alone. But angels do make visible visitations to earth from time to time. In Scripture, there are 24 separate occasions when angels make visitations on earth. 17 times in the Old Testament when angels appear to individuals, sometimes to couples, on one occasion to the whole nation of Israel, and seven times in the New Testament, usually to individuals, uh, on one occasion to a group of shepherds at the time of the birth of Jesus when they announced his birth to them. And in addition to those 24 separate occasions when they make visitations, there are more than 300 references in 34 books of the Bible. That's just over half of the 66 books of the Bible have references to angels, and therefore we may conclude we ought to know something about them, because the Bible does say quite a lot about them. Now we need to be on our guard. Deuteronomy 29:29 29, 29 is an important verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. We may follow the words of this law. There's some things God has revealed, and some things He has not revealed. What he has, re has revealed, we may know with confidence and believe with confidence. What he has not revealed, we must be very, very cautious about. And the great temptation would be to speculate, even telling you some of these stories. The temptation to speculate. Are these angelic visitations? Sometimes, if these are true, they are inevitably so, it, it seems. Such as that event in Ecuador. So what does the Bible tell us about angels? I've looked at most of the 300 references in the last couple of weeks, and I want to reduce it down to three things. Who, what, and how. Who are they, first of all? What do they do, secondly? And how are they arranged? Thirdly, because the Bible does reveal a sort of hierarchy of angelic beings. First of all, who are they? Well, the name angel, the word angel, literally means messenger. The Greek word angelos, 
is the word for messenger, the same word for messenger. Angels, therefore, are messengers of God. And this is primarily how we are to understand them. They belong to the heavenly court, and they act as God's messengers, they act as God's ambassadors, and their task in Scripture is usually delivering messages. That's their task usually in Scripture. Now, let me give you a couple of key things we know about them. Number one, they are created beings. They didn't always exist. They're not eternal as God is eternal with no, with no beginning. They were created. Colossians 1.16 says that by Him, that's by Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. Well, that includes angels, everything in heaven, everything is invisible, everything that has to do with thrones and powers and rulers and authorities were created by Him. Psalm 148, verse 2, says, Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. So he says specifically there that they were created. As to when angels were created, all we know is that they predate the physical universe. And therefore they predate humanity. We know they predate the, hum the, the physical universe because Job... 38 verse 4 says, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy? So there were the angels shouting for joy as God created the world. Now we have no clue as to when God created angels, but uh, before Genesis 1 verse 1, and if it wasn't before Genesis 1, verse 1, the rebellion in heaven, which Lucifer led, took place very quickly because he was there in the Garden of Eden to tempt and uh, destroy what God had intended for Adam and Eve together. So they were created before Genesis 1 and verse 1. So that's the first thing that they are created beings, and the second thing I want to make is they're an altogether different species to humanity. Don't simply see them as human beings with wings. Whether they have wings or not is a debatable point. <laughs> One or two do fly, and some have wings. Cherubim have wings, and seraphim, those are different categories. Uh, but uh, they are an altogether different species. In fact, Psalm 8 tells us Speaking of the creation of man, you made him a little lower than the angels. And you crowned him with glory and honor. So you actually gave the human beings something you didn't give to angels as well. But they're lower than angels. So angels are a higher species than humanity. They are greater than humanity. Because Second Peter 2 verse 10 says speaks of uh, those who corrupt the gospel. He says they're bold and arrogant, these men who are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. So he's just contrasting there. He's really talking about people who slander celestial beings. But angels who are more powerful than we are or they are uh, do not do that as well. So the point is that they are greater than human beings. We can't really compare them with humans because they are sexless. They're neither male nor female. The resurrection, Matthew 22 verse 30 says, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. They're neither male nor female. And they are everlasting. Luke 20 verse 36 says this. It says, those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they can no longer die, for they will be like the angels. They can no longer die. They're everlasting. Having said that, humanity have privileges that angels don't have. First Peter 1 verse 12 tells us there are things that even angels long to look into, but they're not able to. In the fact that we may enjoy this relationship with God, we might be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we might become saved and united with Christ. Angels don't experience that. God has made provision for the salvation of fallen human beings. He has not, and we don't know why, made provision for the salvation of fallen angels. There are angels that have fallen, we talked about this earlier, who have been assigned to hell, and those who have been assigned to earth on their way to their final destruction. 
and there's no provision for their salvation. So don't ever pray for the devil to get converted because it won't happen. There's no provision for that. So that's who they are. Secondly, what they do. What do they do? And if we narrow this down as we must to some generalization of their work, I would say two things. Number one, on earth they represent God. Now we have evidence of that in Luke 1 verse 19. The angel uh, Gabriel answered, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and bring you good news. There's the angel Gabriel saying that I stand before God and he's given me a commission. I've come to you. Now there is a strong idea of guardian angels. And there are hints of this in scripture, but they're only hints. This uh, term, guardian angel, doesn't actually occur in Scripture, but there are some examples that might lead us to believe that. Daniel would be a case in point. When Daniel was in the den of lions in Daniel 6.22, he gave his testimony later. He said, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. Whether he meant that he saw an angel in the, in, the, in the lion's den when he was there, and they saw him shut the mouth of the lions, we don't know. But he says, it was God who sent his angel to protect me at that point. Paul, on his way to Rome in a ship that seemed it was about to sink, and everybody was panicking. And Paul stood up and said in Acts 27, verse 23, Last night an angel of the God whose I am and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. There an angel says to Saul, to Paul rather, that you're going to be okay. You're going to get to Rome. And so another indication of a guardian angel working alongside him. I read that example of Elisha asking God to open the eyes of his servant in Dothan. And when he did, he saw surrounding them hills of chariots and horses, chariots of fire. Jesus, after his period in the wilderness of temptation, it says, then the devil left him and angels came and ministered to him. Angels were there to minister to him. And there's a promise made to all of us in Hebrews 1 and verse 14, which says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? If we read that inclusively, they're sent to serve you and me. And they minister to us who are inheriting salvation. In fact, there's a promise of angelic protection in Psalm 91 and verse 9. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They'll lift you up in their hands. He will not strike your foot against a stone. That had a specific application at its time because we know that people do get hurt. Disasters do before them. The martyrdom of those five men from every human perspective was a disaster. But God was involved, but there were angels there. But that statement there uh, made about angels being with us and operating. Now, of course, some of the angels' biggest work is yet to come because the angels are rehearsing for the climatic event in history when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Matthew 25, 31 tells us, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory. There are millions of angels. John tried to count them once. 10,000 times 10,000, he said. That's 100 million, plus many more that could not be numbered. There are millions and millions of angels, and they're all going to come when the Lord returns with him in the air. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 speaks of the Lord Jesus being revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. In fact, his angel will announce his coming because uh, Matthew 24 verse 31 says he'll send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 tells us that I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. I grew up hearing about the last trump 
think it must be the King James that speaks of the last trump. Trumpet is the full word. <laughs> and it's going to be blown by the angels. And if the angels are going to blow their trumpets, the archangel Michael is going to shout. And some shout it will be. Everybody's going to hear it. That day's still to come. It's a day to which we look forward. So on earth, they represent God. That's what angels do. The second thing is in heaven, they represent people. What I mean by that, there are two categories spoken of, particularly where angels are involved. Firstly, in the lives of children. Matthew 18 and verse 10. Jesus said, see, you don't look down on one of these little ones. He's talking about children. For I tell you, their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. This has been one of the verses in which people use the idea of guardian angels. But certainly, as far as children are concerned, said Jesus, their angels in heaven see the face of the Father. So they're representing children. And the other category specifically spoken of is representing the dying. You see, in Luke 16, Jesus told a story of a rich man and a beggar. The beggar used to live outside the gates of the rich man's home, covered in sores. And I'll read verse 22. The time came when the beggar died, and angels carried him to Abraham's side. Angels are involved with the dying. Well, my third question, the last question, is how are they organized? There's evidence of ranks and categories of angels. I find six categories of angels. The first category is an angel who is described as the angel of the Lord. That is a phrase that reoccurs many times in Scripture. It also speaks sometimes of an angel of the Lord. When it speaks of an angel of the Lord, it could be any angel. When it speaks of the, with a definite article, the angel of the Lord, and I know that in the Greek there was not definite articles, so the translators have felt it appropriate to include it there, but whenever it does, it is what theologians call a theophany or a Christophany. It is God incarnate in a physical form. You remember, and there are many examples of this, there's over 50 times in the Old Testament alone. When Moses at the burning bush saw the bush burst into flame and the bush was not consumed. Most are going to see, why doesn't this bush burn out? And he said, the angel of the Lord spoke to him. And as the conversation developed, it was evident it was not just an angel. The angel was Jehovah himself. Who shall I say sent me, said Moses. He answered, I am who I am. The name Jehovah comes from that. I am. Hagar met with the angel of the Lord. Abraham, when he went to offer Isaac on Mount Moriah, as he was about to put the knife into his son, suddenly the angel of the Lord called him and said, Now I know you fear God. It was God who intervened. I will give you any other examples because there are many and some of you know about them. But the angel of the Lord is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ or God in human flesh. Even, G even Paul on the road to Damascus, Saul of Tarsus, an angel, the angel of the Lord spoke to him. It was Christ himself that he met. Second category is the archangel. Now, there's only one archangel that is mentioned in Scripture, and he's named. His name is Michael. He occurs three times, once in Daniel. And then he's spoken about again. He's mentioned three times. He's mentioned in Daniel uh, as the great prince who protects Israel. And then in First Thessalonians chapter 4, it speaks of the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout of the archangel and with the trump of God. And Jude verse 9 says, even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So the archangel is Michael. It would seem that in the hierarchy there is at the top an archangel. And it seems there's one. His name is Michael. Third category is angels. And there are over 300 references to angels 
generally. Only one angel is named in Scripture, and that's Gabriel. And Gabriel occurs twice in Scripture, 500 years apart. He occurs also in the book of Daniel. While I was in prayer, says Daniel, Daniel 9, verse 21, Gabriel, the man I'd seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. And then he appeared again to Mary. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man called Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. That's in Luke 1, verse 26. Now, although Gabriel's the only angel mentioned by name, and presumably all angels have names, but Gabriel is the only one mentioned to us, then there are literally millions in addition to him, as we've already said, a hundred million plus many more, the book of Revelation tells us. The fourth category is cherubim. And the cherubim are the first angels to appear. They're angelic beings. They appeared in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, verse 24, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Later when Moses built the Ark of the Covenant to place in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, on top of the Ark was placed what the King James calls the mercy seat, the atonement cover, the NIV calls it. And on the atonement cover, on the mercy seat made of gold, were two cherubim with, a with wings outstretched that reached over and touched each other like this. So cherubim have wings. Whether angels have wings, as I say, that's a debatable point. Gabriel came with swift flight, we're told in the book of Daniel. But here at the Ark of the Covenant, uh, they have wings spread outwards, overshadowing the cover, models of them. And cherubim appear a number of times in the Old Testament. They're generally depicted as winged creatures with hands and with feet. If you want to read Ezekiel chapter 10 sometime, you have a most remarkable description of, of cherubim. And uh, there they have four faces... One is the face of a lion, one is the face of a man, one is the face of an ox, and the other is the face of the eagle. So they've got four faces. They each have two pairs of wings. They each have the legs of men, but their feet are like calves' feet. They have four human hands located under each wing. They move in groups of four, forming a square. And their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, and their wings, are full of eyes. Amazing description. Their duty primarily was to keep Adam and Eve out of the garden so they would not access a tree of life. And interestingly, Satan was originally a cherub, which is singular for cherubim, which is plural. The fifth category are seraphim. They only occur once in that well-known passage in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah, in the year the king Uzziah died, saw the Lord high and lifted up. And these uh, seraphim came. They were six-winged creatures. With two of their wings, they covered their faces. With two of their wings, they covered their feet. With two of their wings, they flew. And then Isaiah adds, And one of the seraphs flew to me with a live cold in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched the lips of Isaiah and said, Your sins are forgiven, you're cleansed. And he was appointed to, him, appointed to his ministry. And that's the only occasion when seraphim appear in Scripture, six-winged creatures. It's possibly a sixth category. There was higher even than the archangel Michael. And that was the name that we know as Lucifer, which means morning star, the brightest star in the night sky. Lucifer, on account of his beauty, wanted to be one step higher, which would be to be equal with God. And because of his pride, he was driven out of heaven. And uh, he could have been a category that was supreme in heaven, above all the other angels and archangels, but was driven out because of his pride. Now let me finish very briefly with a warning. There is a cult of angels around that's quite strong. You will see little models of angels for sale in all kinds of little trinket stores and the people get superstitious about them and they buy them and stick them on their pianos and next to their bed and in their cupboards and hang them from their rear view mirror in their cars 
And uh, the New Age movement has made a lot of angels, a lot of the angels' sites on the websites that you can access our New Age. A lot of books that are good sellers and angels are New Age. And I want to finish with this warning. Three things that we must not do. We are not to pray to angels. Please don't go home tonight and say, Angel, please look after me on this busy 401. <laughs> there is one mediator between God and man. And they're not saints. They're not angels. It's Christ himself. So we're not to pray to angels. Secondly, we're not to worship angels. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, Don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. You see, the worship of angels, one of the false doctrines that was being taught in Colossae. In the church in Colossae, there was a, there was, there was a, a heresy that involved all kinds of things, including the worship of angels. Now, angels may be very tempting to worship. John, the apostle, was tempted to worship an angel. In Revelation 19 and verse 10, John writes of uh, being spoken to by an angel. Let me read what he says in Revelation 19 verse 10. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do this. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. There's John seeing these angels as we one day will see them as they come with Christ. And in all their glory and beauty, we might be tempted like he was tempted to fall down. And then he says, don't do it, we're just servants. Worship God. Don't worship angels. And thirdly, we're not to seek angels. We're not to seek angels. Angels act on God's initiative alone. They are messengers by definition. He sends them often without us knowing. In fact, one of the great things about angelic activity is we don't know about it most of the time. Hebrews 13 says, Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. When an angel operates, they often don't declare themselves. In Scripture, they often did, but not always. And he speaks of entertaining angels unawares. Now, I've heard lots of stories, as you've probably heard lots of stories, about people turning up in difficult situations. I just read one today about somebody whose child was running in the direction of a busy road, and suddenly a poorly dressed man from nowhere ran, picked up the child, put him back on the pavement, on the sidewalk, walked behind a tree and never walked out the other side of the tree, and they went to thank him, and he wasn't there. And this person says, maybe it was an angel. Well, those stories are two a penny. There are lots of stories like that, and you've probably heard some. Like people are hitchhiking, and they get into the car, and they give some messages, then disappear. I've heard stories of crisis come back in 2000, because hitchhikers told people that and then disappeared. Well, they weren't angels, because it didn't happen. The point is this. Let's not go looking for them. That's why I said at the beginning, one of the difficulties in talking about angels here tonight is there's nothing for you to do at the end of this message. If I give an appeal tonight, what do I appeal to you to do? I'm just telling you what Scripture tells us we might know. But although there are principalities and powers with which we are at enmity, and Scripture warns us of that, and we're to stand strong in the Lord as we fight against these satanic powers and demonic powers which would seek to destroy us, there are also powers that are good, that God has created, and that God sends to engage in His work. We can take home the encouragement that angels are active. We know that Christ is active. And we say, well, what can beat that? Nothing can beat the fact that Christ is active, that Christ lives within us. But it's encouraging to us to know there are angelic beings. And I find the most encouraging thing is the bit I said, where angels are told, we're told are involved in the lives of children. They're the most vulnerable, the most easiest to exploit and to abuse. Angels are involved in the lives of children. And angels are involved in the lives of the dying. And we need to take comfort from that and take courage from that. And God in his sovereignty at any time may send angels to intervene. That's his business. Don't look for them. Don't seek them. Don't try to identify them. You pick up a hitchhiker or somebody offers you, a, you know, something that you needed and didn't know you needed. And then they go down into the subway and you don't see him again. What well, must have been an angel. 
Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Just be glad they provided what you needed. And trust that God in his sovereignty has all the forces of heaven working in the interests of men and women and boys and girls who minister to those who inherit salvation. Next week, join Living Truth for the beginning of an exciting three-part series, Journey to Africa. Charles Price goes on location to South Africa to see what the churches there are doing to respond to the AIDS pandemic.